And Lou, tell me about your organization's work and mission and how it relates to uh, climate change action. Okay. So I work for the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, um, which is uh, it's part of the, the, the consultative group for international agricultural research. So, so we're a, a trans, a pan-tropical research center. We work on agriculture across the tropics in, in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Um, and a lot of, of what's disturbing agriculture, what's, what's impeding progress in agriculture, is climate related. Um, you know, climate events, uh, medium term climate trends are having a significant impacts on, on food security, on, on food production. And so we work on, on a whole host of, of elements including you know, improving crops and, and croplands. We, we have a, a breeding group that's actually trying to breed for the, the uh, breed varieties of several crops for the, the changing conditions. We have uh, agronomists working on improving management to to adapt to, to, to the new conditions that are appearing in many places of the world. And we have folks who are working on a more sort of a landscape scale, trying to, to integrate um, agriculture and a whole host of, of ecosystem services into a more, more of a livelihoods perspective to support rural communities and to support people trying to make a living in these landscapes to adapt to, to the, the challenges that climate change is posing and also to reduce their impact on, on the climate system. And how would you, Lou, when you inform policymakers and other stakeholders, you know, what to you is a climate resilient landscape or ag our agriculture. So when we focus on climate resilience, I try to think about variability over the course of, of 10 to 20 years time frames. You know, not 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 looking forward to, to what's going to happen in 2100. You know, that's really not helpful to, to policymakers. So if, if we start with the current climate variability, it's a good place to start with understanding whether whether uh, agricultural systems and, and livelihood systems in these landscapes are adapted to current conditions or not. And if, if they're currently stressed under current conditions, we know we're going to have some, some significant problems as conditions get more and more str uh, stressful and, and, and challenging for these people. So, so we're looking at not just the, 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 the production at the field scale, but, but the, you know, taking a livelihoods perspective to this, you look at you know, how, what, what, how are forests important to people's livelihoods? What's happening with water in these landscapes? How does the, 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 the location of different um, ecosystems in these landscapes, managed and, and natural ecosystems, affect all of the, the services that people depend upon? for their livelihoods. And this includes you know, um, pollination services for, for, for agriculture, for example. You know, forests are, and, and, and natural ecosystems are reservoirs of, of pollinators in these landscapes, and we, we need those as well. And a lot of times when, you know, Red Plus came out as a scheme, um, there was some criticism. It was too focused on carbon, didn't look at the livelihoods involved, and also the agriculture aspect. Can you talk a bit about that, and how has that evolved for something a bit more holistic? Red Plus has certainly evolved, and I think a lot of, of uh, that evolution was, was pushed forward by the, the, the safeguards that were put in place. Because the safeguards, you know, had the, there, were, there were social safeguards, there were environmental safeguards that were put in there, um, in, in addition to the, to the legal and, and, and permanence safeguards um, of, of carbon. Um, and that, that brought the attention back to the, the fact that, you know, we're not just talking about locking up forests and, and keeping them away from people and, and dispossessing people of resources that are important to, to, to what they're trying to do in these landscapes. It's about working with people to move from the, the current unsustainable situation to a more sustainable situation. You know, we're here at the Global Landscapes Forum and there's a lot of this use of this keyword landscapes and this landscapes approach. And what does that mean to you? Uh, to me, it puts people at the center of what we're doing. And that was missing a lot in, in, in some of our, the debates we were having in, in forestry and in, in maybe a little bit less in agriculture. Um, but it's, it's, it's about understanding that in order for people to be good and, and have productive and healthy lives in their landscapes, they need more than just uh, the, the agricultural production and, and they need access to, to resources. So it's, it's understanding that, that the, the, the constellation of ecosystems in the landscape is what's really important to people. Um, and, and we want to see more, uh, more attention paid to the, the, the non-managed or, or the less managed aspects of the landscape. Um, and it's not just about the part that we're, we're managing intensively. So I, I think this landscape approach, by putting people in the middle, takes a, a, a more reasonable and, and, and productive approach to, to sustainable development and a more holistic approach to sustainable development because it's not just about you know, agriculture here or forestry there. You know, it, it, people are making their livelihoods by using all the ecosystems in their landscapes and paying attention to that is really important. And can you kind of talk to me about what your session, your takeaway message is? You know, that, that. So we're going to be presenting, uh, I guess, four, um, four types of investments that, that, that people could consider for uh, mitigating climate change. Our, our session is really focused on the mitigation side. Um, so we're going to be talking about, you know, what can be done in the livestock sector, what can be done with, with peatlands in particular, because there's some very interesting new data about, the, about peatlands 
and, and that, that actually explains that the, the, the magnitude of the problem is much bigger than we, we had uh, understood before, and it's, it's also in other regions of the, the world than, than we had been thinking about traditionally. Um, we'll have uh, so a look at, at cropping systems, we'll be looking at uh, agroforestry and trees on farms and those potentials, and trying to explain to the, to the audience, you know, how each of these types of investments can actually contribute to, to climate change mitigation and what's the order of magnitude that we can expect, and, and make, sort of making the case of why investment needs to be looking at these options.